Guy Nispina, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks very much for having me. It's good to be here. Great to have you. Uh, we'd like to address the elephant in the room to start off with, I guess, a uh, podcast called Between Two Beers. Uh, and I've got two gentlemen beside me who I'm sure are going to tell me about how they've found a better life without booze. Yeah, well, I've got three beers in front of me and a glass of water, but and I think I know which one I'll be reaching for. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, likewise, but... Uh, well, it depends how the interview goes, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. But we're going to get into all of that. But the book's out, new book out today. That's right. The Drinking Game is is out, and it's my first real book. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. So it's uh, I don't know these things exist in your head and then in your computer files for a long time, and then there's this weird feeling that oh my god, other people are going to read it. <laughs> so it's a, but um, yeah, so it's a mix of uh, some some nervousness, um, but excitement too. Bit of delayed gratification, I imagine, with a book. You, you do a good interview, you're hearing about it straight away. With a book, you might not get feedback for six months down the line, you know, when people get around to reading it, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it is a, a delayed gratification thing. And I kind of, um, I spent 30 years in journalism, and, and every year I've wanted to do something new. And so I've done newspapers, and I've, I spent 10 years in television. It's coming up 10 years on radio. Um, I'd never done a book before, and I wanted to do one, so... Yeah, it was partly partly about having a new challenge. Yeah, we are going to get into the um, the no drinking thing uh, a little bit later in the episode, but just briefly off the top, how has it changed your life? Oh, massively, actually. It's um, been been a huge change. Um, yeah, I mean, drinking like a lot of people, drinking for me was something that went with all occasions. You know, births, deaths, marriages, get a new job, lose a job, every occasion celebrations, commiserations was with alcohol, you know, meeting a girl for the first time, being a teenager, bonding with friends, you know, all that was with alcohol. Alcohol was my partner in crime every step of the way. So to give that up after about 35 years or not quite that long, but say 14 or 15 um, to about 47, whatever the maths is on that, you know, I would have been drunk every weekend. And that's not that unusual for a Kiwi guy no. who, who's a Gen Xer, born yep. in 1970. Um, that's a pretty ordinary kind of story. Uh, I think the surprising thing for me was how easy it was to give the substance up uh, and how hard the social expectation side was. Um, it was quite weird to just, you know, divorce myself from, from alcohol uh, relatively easily, um, yet the expectations, the weight of expectations from others was um, was really great. And that was part of um, the reason... And part of the message that I wanted to, to write this book to, to, to examine why that is and examine some of the challenges that, that we face when we make a, a decision that we're not drinkers. It's an interesting one. Right? I've just come back from a wedding in Brisbane and first time to see a group of friends that I haven't seen since I made this, this decision. They, they were aware of it. And same thing. It's sort of like you're met with, oh, good for you. I'm glad that's going well. And then inevitably, after a few beers from other people, it's that the questions start around well, why, why, you know, why, why, what's, what is it, what is it about that, what is it? And there's a curiosity around it as well. I think there's societally, there's, I don't know if that's a word. There is, um, it is now. Yeah, it is. Guy could tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's becoming more and more acceptable. Is probably the wrong way to do it, but it's 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 a choice and it's an option that people have. And I, there was at the end of the night, someone who was on that um, sober driver buzz that then thought, oh, I'd like to have a couple of drinks. And I just said, yeah, that's fine. I'll just hand me the keys to the truck and I can drive you and straight away ripped into it. it, um, it it's uh, becoming more and more of a conversation, I feel, in those social settings. Yeah, well, I think they've got a phrase for it, haven't they? Sober curious, you hear that phrase, <laughs> phrase a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, I knew that yeah, one. Yeah, and um, I, think, I think there is a bit of, a, a bit of that. Uh, it just amazed me that I did all sorts of stupid things, and some of those these tales are in the um, in, in the book. Everything from embarrassing myself in front of the the greatest living New Zealanders in Antarctica to setting my hand on fire in a pub. No one ever said to me once, "Hey, why are you drinking so much?" Not once. But when I stopped drinking, they were like, "Why aren't you drinking?" And, and I just thought this is kind of crazy. Like this is this reverse burden of proof on it. Um, and, and part of it, I think, is people projecting, and you can kind of see the fear in their eyes when you say to them, oh, I'm not only just not drinking tonight, I'm not drinking ever. Yeah. And, and they're kind of like, I think they're thinking, how would I go with that? Or are you making a comment on what I'm doing? Yeah. And I guess that's the uh, the difficulty that I had. It's like, 
I don't care what you're drinking, mate. You know, if we're having a good quarter at all and having a good time, then that's cool. Why are you so interested in what's in my glass? Like, it kind of it's kind of weird how you get this sort of cone of silence or this big unity um, in drinking, right? That somehow you're letting the side down or you, you're a spy who's been sent in to infiltrate and report back if, if you're the one who's not, not drinking. Totally. It's kind of a weird uh, scenario. And, and you do need any of the people listening who are thinking about doing this or in the early stages of it, you need some strategies, eh? I mean, lying's good. If you can say, oh, I'm pregnant or I'm training for an endurance <laughs> marathon, I mean, it's one of those excuses would work for me, but the other probably wouldn't. Yeah, I'm you the same. You Actually, no, both of, those <laughs> don't, both of those don't work for me at all. You kind of need a strategy, especially for me, the hardest bit was when you walk into the gig, right? When you walk into someone's house or the party or, or the, and the host is usually really keen to give you a drink and it comes from a good place, you know, because this is our culture really. And you, you kind of need your yarn sorted out or your strategy sorted out to a degree. It, it gets easier as you go along. I'm nearly four years into it um, and I, I don't give a shit now. Um, I, I'm, I'm sweet with, with, with any of that. But yeah, there's, there's, there's some pretty rough moments early on. Like the couple of gigs I picked early on were, were, were pretty tough. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting with, a, like I said, a podcast called Between Two Beers. Even the culture has changed in the three and a half years we've been doing it, the amount of conversations we've had similar to this. But I am going to build us back into this because I kind of want to paint the picture of you to sort of show, you know, what a what an important part alcohol play. I'm not sure important is the right word. What a, what a big part alcohol played in your life. But to get there, there's so much depth. And uh, we often talk about how tight or loose a guest circle is. And that's measured by how many interesting yarns your friends and colleagues share about you. And uh, you have what we describe as a loose circle. <laughs> so we've got many interesting uh, bits to unpick. And we wanted to start with cricket. Uh, we have heard you were a very good age group cricketer who once captained Chris Cairns. Is this accurate? Well, it is accurate. It, it, it was the under-16 Canterbury team. And... It, it's probably a bit more revealing to say that he was also in the under-18 team at the, same, <laughs> at the same time. I mean, he was a man and I was a boy. I mean, I still remember we, he, he came up from Otago when we were sort of 13, 14, and he was already bowling God knows how fast. Um, so he's an extraordinary uh, cricketer. But yeah, I, I was nuts on cricket and a mad keen cricketer um, back in my uh, Christchurch days. And, and played with a few guys who went on to do pretty well. I uh, played with Stephen Fleming's, uh, he's a bit younger, a few years younger than me, but um, in the Sydney, Sydney teams and at Kashmir High School. And there's a couple of others. Uh, Chris Harris was one, oh, yeah. one of the other ones kicking around. Not quite so intimidating as Chris Cairns, uh, I imagine. No, 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 he's a good all-rounder, though. But, um, yeah, so, you know, that, that that's true. Um, but that was about, that, that, I, I peaked about there, I think, eh? I there's, a few, there's a few of us that did that. that, that, that yeah, those, those under-16, those age group years, and that was the highlight of your kind of life, <laughs> yeah. sporting-wise. Yeah. Dined out on the story a few times, too, to be honest. Have you given up? Have you, have you retired? Retired yeah, from, I from have, all I re cricket? I retired hurt, really. <laughs> I mean, I... I, I'm still a big runner. Running's a big part of my, my life. And so my body will, will do that quite well. But when I try to go back into another sport, soccer was the other one, what we call football now. I still call, call it soccer. Everyone knows what I mean. The one with the round ball. Um, and Jack Tame, who's a mate of mine, got me back into a social game of that. And I was doing pretty well until I was running away from a couple of 30-something guys. And then the old Achilles went you know, with a calf <laughs> and I was on the ground. And so it um, really... It distressed me because it got in the way of my running. So I kind of pick my moments, and I find if I get back into a sport like that, then um, the old body's not 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 that uh, enthusiastic. Mm. The mind's in it. But mm. I hear you. Um, so I've got a really beautiful seg lined up. Um, friend of the show, Paddy Gower, suggested you organised yourself as a political editor, like a Test cricket captain. He said, uh, "I'm going to quote him." He'd set the field, he'd bowl for the occasion, he'd bat for the wicket, hit the odd six, and put the bad ball away. And he also likened you to a cricketer in the press gallery. He said he was the best. He was precise, deadly consistent, like a good fast bowler, line and length, very strategic, could set a good field. Does that sound fair? <laughs> well, it's very, it's very, very kind uh, from 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 Paddy. Um, and yeah, I, I and I didn't quite, you know, set the world on fire uh, like like Gow does. I mean, Gow would come in and just blow it all up like a Lance Kins, yeah, Chris Chris's dad. Um, Been on the pod. Yeah, Lance Kins. yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, the Gisborne. good great, dude. Great yeah, chat. yeah, amazing guy. Um, but but yeah, I, I guess I, I, I guess um, I, I probably am a, a quite a strategic person, I suppose, in, in that sense. I take stuff seriously that I want to do well and, and chip away at it. 
I've had to work quite hard at, 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 at things I've done, and you know it does. It is a nice segue from from the cricket because it's a kind of it's kind of the same thing. Like I was nowhere near the natural talent of a of you know of a Chris Keynes, obviously, or a Stephen Fleming. I had to really chip away, and I've had to work at stuff that I've I've done like that. I haven't had masses of natural talent that's just you know burst into it. I I have had to be quite disciplined, um, and and be st- quite strategic. So yeah, I probably did approach um, my political journalism like that. I never thought about it, but um, as always, Paddy's probably pretty uh, pretty on the money. Um, I, I want to sort of paint the picture in and take you right into the parliamentary press gallery. Um, so you worked for ten years as a journalist, and then you edited the Sunday Star Times. Was it? Uh, and and then you've gone over to TVNZ. You've become the political editor. So you're anchoring Q and A. You've done the gender and breakfast before you switch over to three, but. In this period where the, you're the TVNZ political editor, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about, I'm not sure we call it the golden years, but where you're on one station and Duncan's on the other. And Paddy again has come in. He said, I was in awe of Guyan and Duncan Garner. They were incredible when at the peak of their powers. One different channels, but taking each other on and going for beers afterwards. The rest of the gallery was jealous. They were accused of colluding. And then... Yeah, that 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 period's fascinating to me. Like, what what do you recall of of, of that time? Yeah, again, uh, he's he's pretty on the mark there. Duncan and I were very close uh, friends at, at that point, and we were also fierce competitors. That's quite a strange situation to be in, mm. and we used to play with that. He'd thump me most of the time for the first few years. You know, he'd deck me. Um, an incredible political journalist. I sort of almost credit Duncan Garner with inventing the political TV track, you know, the package that we see now. Um, he, he kind of almost invented that style, a, a formidable, tough uh, journalist. And so competing with him was absolutely full on, and I had to be pretty strategic about that. We, we used to say we'd compete at home and collude abroad. Uh, abroad we probably would, um, you know, give each other a bit more of a break. But we used to have pe- ha- have have each other on. You know, what you'd do is you'd run around uh, breaking some story and then um, you'd do a live every night and the press gallery is just this corridor and all the doors are open to the different newsrooms and so what you'd do is you'd, you'd lined your exclusive up your tape package you had it already down and then you put your feet up on the desk so when the guy walked past he'd think oh yes but it doesn't have a track tonight <laughs> and, and then after he'd walked past in, in the earpiece went and you'd be out on the forecourt and you knew, and uh, and you were doing it to beat the other guy because you loved him as well, but you wanted to smash him. It was just like in that sports thing. And so you knew that he'd be watching, and his bosses would be watching one and three, and then you'd be um, you'd be lead story, and their phone would ring, and what? Why haven't you got that yarn? And the same thing would happen to me. You know, brrr, would go the landline on the desk. You pick it up, and you go, oh yeah, guy, I'm just watching three. Um, did we know about this? And you're like, oh yeah, we decided it wasn't a story or some some excuse. But yeah, so we'd. Um, We'd we'd compete hard and um, it was a lot of fun. Um, if you were going up to Auckland from Wellington to to knock off some exclusive talent, you know there was a bit of a code that it was an admin day. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're just doing some admin, <laughs> mate. And the other guy'd be like, oh my god, he's doing admin, and he'd be running around trying to find out what you're up to. Oh, it's just an admin day, mate. Yeah, just are, just. Are you are you texting each other as well as oh, you're yeah. watching a story? You yeah. bastard. Yep. <laughs> um, see you at six. Watch it and weep. <laughs> really? Is it? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, 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 it was hard out. You know, we give each other absolute death. Um, and it was the only way to get through it, in a way, um, at, w- with a bit of a help from, from our liquid friends, you know, which was a big part of that. Um, but, um, yeah, a strange, a strange position. We had our fallouts. One time he um, got hold of my poll results, which cost about 10 grand in those days to do one poll. Colmar at, Brunton. Yeah, Colmar Brunton, and ran them like on a Friday night. How did he get hold of them? Well, there was an internal investigation at TVNZ into that, and I think they fingered the guy, um, but they couldn't quite you prove can't, it. You can't do that in 20. 20- <laughs> you cannot yeah. finger anyone in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think they they got the, they got the guy, but um, they, they, nothing actually ever happened. But but he um, so that was how fierce it was. Uh, yeah, we. Um, it's a good thing we didn't come to blows because there was no no question about who would have come off second best in that. I'm, I'm glad um, you're, you're you're pulling the curtain back on the press gallery because it's a term that I flippantly used. I didn't one know actually what it physically was, but two, you're so right. As consumers, we see the track. We don't see anything that goes on behind the scenes, and that's the part that fascinates me: is the manoeuvring and the 
the gamesmanship between the two, yeah, two wily old heads at the at the top of their game. Yeah, because and the and y- you talk about where it is because the geography, if you like, is quite important because it's really weird when you go into the press gallery from outside in a newsroom because especially I don't think the media is as competitive as it was, but that's that's my view. Um, but you know, you had obviously. You know, you've got a close shop building as a, as a media organisation. So as a press gallery journalist, to walk in and suddenly you've got 30 other media organisations there, all with the doors open in this corridor, and then all hunting in the same pack. You will have seen on the TV, you know, the division bells ringing, you hear that noise in the background, and there are white tiles, and they're all big press gallery pack asking their questions. So what do you do if you've got an exclusive? Well, you don't want to be there asking your question about consultants' fees or whatever it was, do you? So you've got to find a little corner of the building, you pull them aside. You know, it's it's strategic. It's like a clue game you know um, and you've got to you've got to find a place that you can hold on to this exclusive like holding on to an exclusive for a day or maybe even two days with 30 other um, reptiles lurking around is not easy and how, and how big is your team Oh, back in those days, be four or five. Oh. Yeah, um, TVNZ was always slightly bigger, being public sector. So we, I think, I think we maxed out at five. But my our best work was done when there were three of us, and against his three. That was weirdly that was the best it was. And um, the TV three would always be three people back in those days. Um, yeah, so to be sort of three on three, and as as the political editor, you'd you'd be managing the other people's stories as well as your own. Um, and then you'd be live most nights, which was pretty stressful, really. You know, especially you'd come over from newspapers. Live television is pretty frightening. Um, some of the younger ones they grow up with the lives, and they they're, on, they're u- really used to being on camera. Um, so I, I found it quite quite full on, quite stressful um, to come over from you know ten years of newspapers straight into TV. So that was an added element of of stress for me. Yeah, it is a weird day, isn't it, where it builds towards that sort of 6pm and then afterwards there's that release and we've talked to a lot of guests who have done similar work where there's just that big outlet afterwards and you go for a beer, you unwind and that's an important part of your job really. Like In order to maintain it day after day you need that release and it's just a unique and bizarre situation that you go and have beers with the person you are most at competition with. It's it's so unique. But also your subjects as well, occasionally, right? You oh, were... yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in, in those days, 3.2, which was at the bar because it's on the third floor of the Beehive, um, was roaring in, in full steam. When I first came into the press gallery in the l- late 90s, it was in 1998 I came into the press gallery for the Evening Post newspaper, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a great paper at the time. Um, you know, still smoking in bars, and you'd go in there, and Winston would be in there, Doug Graham would be in there with a cigar. Um, you'd have to get your suit dry cleaned after about seven minutes um, of being in the bar because it absolutely reeked. It was a classic, you know, um, smoky bar scenario with dark secrets being traded in the corner. And as a as a kid, I called myself a kid. I was about twenty seven, but I was a pretty young twenty seven. Um, you know, it was fascinating to me, and um, yeah, it was a big big part of the culture there. There was still a very heavy drinking culture. Um, in the late 90s, it was probably the end of the really heavy drinking culture. Remember, we're coming off the back of a New Zealand where the Prime Minister announced a snap election, utterly wasted, not just a little bit tipsy after a couple of beers, but completely and utterly smashed. And anyone who wants to go and Google it and see the footage on YouTube nowadays or on um, Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision or whatever it's on, it's utterly astonishing. The guy can barely speak. There wasn't a word mentioned about it in the newspapers the next day. Mm. That gives you the level of acceptability that it had in um, in political life and in our wider culture. And I say in, in the book, you know, that this started in 1854 when Parliament met for the first time. The very first law they passed was allowing MPs to drink in Parliament. Wow. That's the very first thing the legislator did when the House met for the very first time. The first bit of legislation on the books is a rule allowing uh, MPs to drink at Parliament. Get your priorities <laughs> right, eh? <laughs> so, that, so it's kind of, like, you know, start as you mean to continue, really. So one of our sources, and you might be able to work out who this is, uh, given the question, um, has suggested we ask this question. So you, Duncan and John Key, pre-Prime Minister, go for a drink. It was quite controversial at the time, and it got leaked to the Sunday Star Times, but only one of you three could have leaked it. Who leaked it and why? <laughs> well, 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 I say in the book that... Um, Duncan Garner swears it wasn't him, and I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, okay. it, 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 and part part of the part of the cryptic stuff with politics, and you, so I've probably absorbed a bit too much of this, is you get answers like that, and you got to go, shit, am I going to run it or not? Yeah. What would you do with that? Who leaked it? Yeah, John Key. 
That's that was my conclusion too. <laughs> no, it wasn't John Key. Oh. <laughs> Well, I've I thought, read that wrong. Yeah, I thought the clue was the Sunday Star Times, given your previous involvement with the with the publication. But then I thought, oh, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that was that was a number of years before that story got uh, from the bar to the to the front of the um, front of the newspaper. But yeah, why there's still some sensitivity about it is that it's technically off the record, isn't it? No one ever said, oh, look, it's def- it's off the record, but we knew it was off the record. But, you know, time rolls on and, and, and everything in there is is is, uh, is true. And, um, yeah, he, he wouldn't be worried about it. That's what I wanted to ask you is the off the record. When you're in the smoky bars back in the day, is anything genuinely off the record? Yeah, it, 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 it is in that you wouldn't ever go and report that, you know, Doug Graham told me in the bar that such and such. But the inf- you're allowed to act on the information. Mm. You know, so if someone says to you, look, didn't come from me, mate, but, um, you know, that decision on the frigate that they were looking at making on Monday, it's off the table, they're not going to do it. It ain't going to happen. Um, a good journalist would use that information as, you know, as a starting point and try and firm it up. You know, most people wouldn't let you run it anyway, and I wouldn't want to run it just on one source in a bar. But if it was coming from someone pretty good, you know, if it was the defence minister, maybe you would. Mm. Um, but you'd, you'd use that to then, um, you know, firm it up. And and a, a lot of politics, is, uh, political journalism is like that. Um and yeah, you can run away and run the stories, and some of the younger ones do, but you look pretty foolish if you're wrong, and your reputation doesn't last that long if, if you get it wrong. Yeah, you know, it's a, a, reputation's got to be everything. Right? Yeah, it does really in, in, that, in, that, um, in that sort of area, and it's pretty, you, you know, it's, it's long, long to build up and, and quick to lose, really. Is there ever any, any instances of people throwing red herrings to, to test someone's kind of... Oh, yeah. Situation, especially when they first start. Oh yeah, disastrous ones. I remember one um, press secretary who um, had a, a youngish gallery guy who'd taken over and wanted to make a big splash, and there was had been some big inquiry into this press secretary's minister. Has he been accused of this wrongdoing? And his press secretary, to make the minister look good for this inquiry, leaked him the bits of the report that made him look like he'd been vindicated. Oh. And the guy ran it as a big yarn in one of the Sundays. And then the, st- the full inquiry came out on the Monday or Tuesday, and it was like, yeah, those pars looked pretty good for your guy, <laughs> but the re- <laughs> the other 700 pages didn't. And you know, and oh, it's it a bit of a laughing song. I still remember it today, yeah. don't I? So and having a laugh about it now. So yeah, that's not cool. So you you got to you got to be pretty careful about being used because it does happen. Everyone's you know, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a um, you know, it's quite a few piranhas in the pond. Yeah. if you want to put it that way. You were. Uh, one of the biggest stars at TVNZ, uh, like we said, Q&A, Agenda and Breakfast, and then you moved to TV3. What was that? Cross the floor. Cross the floor. Yeah, I did, um, didn't I? Cross the aisle. That, that's a big move. Was it, was it a hard decision to make? Why, why did you move? I wanted to move from Wellington, and I, I wanted to leave Parliament while I still loved it, and I still, I still do, and, and I, I, I loved my time there, and I wanted to move. And I'd been talking, to, I'll be honest with you, I'd been talking to TVNZ at the time about how... You know, I wanted to move from Wellington. I wanted to, I'd done nearly 15 years in the press gallery, some, some of those for newspapers, a lot of it for TVNZ, and I said to them, look, I want to move to Auckland and, and start something new. And we were working through, you know, could I get this hybrid gig where I'd do some, you know, doco-style yarns for Sunday and, and a sort of one of those hybrid sort of uh, gigs with different sort of portfolios in it. And um, TVNZ was in a little bit of a mess at the time and then the head of news resigned and the whole thing just sort of fell apart. And I met uh, Mark Jennings for a... It was probably a wine at the time, um, and he had an opening on 60 Minutes, and I thought, oh, bugger it, I'll, I'll have a crack. You know, I wanted to get um, and do some investigative reporting, and so I came across a TV3 um, where my mate Duncan was, and uh, Duncan Garner and I started two new shows, The Vote, mm-hmm. and The Degree, which we launched when we lost the licence to 60 Minutes, um, we, we launched that as a current affairs show. Um, in the end, only he did two years at TV3, but um, he must have been so excited he because was. he was lo- <laughs> he was losing his biggest rival and he was gaining his mate to come on side. <laughs> yeah, like, happy that, days that, for that, Duncan that, Gunner. That's right, and we had a lot of fun, and we um, hosted hosted um, Third Degree together. I mean, this has been one of the cool things that I'm smiling about now is that I've had a chance, um, especially in my later um, years, to to work with some of my friends. I've been hosting Morning Report with Corin Dan, who's a very close friend with my, uh, of mine uh, this week. So it's pretty cool to uh, do something you love, but also uh, with people that you really like too. Yeah, I'm keen to move into the uh, Morning Report 
um, stuff. T- 2014, you joined Morning Report. And last night doing my research, uh, I was sort of watch- looking through old, old clips and things. And I thought, oh, I'll just have a look at that really memorable Winston Peters interview <laughs> from 2017. <laughs> Amazing. I'll, I'll, just watch, I'll just watch a few minutes of it just to remind yeah. myself what was said. And I ended up watching the whole thing. Whole 25, 25 minutes. minutes. Yep. It was amazing. It was so captivating. The cat and mouse, the Winston sends someone to go and get the forms and then there's a, the stuff wrong. It, like the, the mental gymnastics. It, you can tell you've got this relationship, uh, like this this deep past relationship. You're kind of giving each other smirks and things. Is that one of the most memorable interviews you've done? I think it is the most memorable interview I've done. Um, it, it, it would be my favourite interview. Um, and, and you've touched on, on some, of the, some of the reasons there. Um, I had decided and told Morning Report I really wanted to do a series of leaders' interviews before that 2017 election. And I said I wanted to do them to be 25 minutes so that they would be uh, 7.35 to 8 o'clock, you know, and there's, and there's no commercials on, on, on that. So 25 minutes quite a long time for a politician. You, 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 someone like Winston can start a fight, throw a grenade, you know, he accuses you of being a Nazi or something. You take the bait and start arguing with, with him and then he's run down the clock, you know, like the All Blacks used to do and it's all over. Um, what you see in that interview is him looking at the clock, realising he can't do that. Yeah, There's yeah. another 20 minutes to go. A- and I'd also I'd been losing sleep about where I was going to go on this because the guy came into Parliament in 1978, so there's a fair bit of ground to traverse if you wanted to. So, but I thought, nah, I'll just stick purely to whether his costings added up. Just that narrow. I'll just focus on that and just pick away at that. And, and, and that tactic sort of kept him... You know, if we want to go back to cricketing analogies, just he, he had to play and he had to play and he had to play because it just kept on bowling that line and length at him and didn't get rattled and didn't take the bait. You know, I'd let the bouncers fly by. And so, um, no, it's probably probably stretch the analogy to, bro- <laughs> to, break going, in, to breaking the point. Um, and, um, and got some pretty fascinating results. We, we called it the body in the boot interview afterwards because he gets one of his goons to go down and because uh, he... He claimed he wasn't sacked a third time. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, so, and so he claims he's got evidence of it just in his boot. So he gets this goon to come. And, 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 and I was like, um, I took a risk because I said, well, why don't you go and get the evidence in? And then I thought, shit, maybe he's going to just leave in the studio. Yeah. But now he gets his goon in to go and do it. And then the goon comes back about five minutes before the interview with this document. And there's some sort of relitigation about whether or not he was sacked or not. So, yeah, I mean, Winston, but, but he's even, a character, isn't he? But, but even that moment when Winston gets handed the thing and he's reading it, you don't know what he's reading. Yeah, and read. then he says it validates his position and then passes it to you. And then I was wondering what's gone through your head. Am I really going to read this and argue with him? And I could see your decision is just like, okay. Can I, get, can I get a copy of it? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> but, but the tone of it as well, like, like I'm, I'm watching that as well. And, and you're, when you're going after the website, like it's just in the moment, like how much of that is just free flow you're in the zone and you've you're just going for them well that, that, that's actually a really perceptive perceptive question because the 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 sort of moment that really resonated with people because the costings didn't just didn't stack up like he hadn't done the costings and then he was saying that the information on this website was wrong and so i was entertaining some of that as a possibility and he said Oh, someone must have come into the website and, and changed the numbers. Mm. And at that point, he said, "Come on, mate. Yeah, mm. that, that. Come on, mate." Mm. And I think it's 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 uh, the public. I think kind of like that because you you kind of have that plausible deniability in political interviewing at times, don't you? When you know he's bullshitting, the interviewer knows he's bullshitting, but everyone's too sort of polite to go around right. at the edges of it. So that was a kind of lift the curtain moment to a degree where it's just like, "Come on, this is this is crap." Mate. It was the "come on, mate," the mate part mm. of it. Thought that it, mm. it so it spoke to. There's there's a, obviously a long history of of time spent together, and there must be a while it, it outwardly doesn't look like that. There must be a mutual respect between the two of you. Oh yeah, no, he's 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 run into me and had had big laughs. We've had huge nights out on on, on the terps. Um, in Fiji. Yeah, if Fiji, yeah, who said that? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, Fiji and and, um, <laughs> and others. Yeah, gosh, that was a story. Happy to talk about any of that um, within the bounds of. Uh, uh, defamation. <laughs> yeah, let's go there because it was one of our one of our sources has suggested um, to ask him what his best Winston Peters drinking story was, and was it in Fiji? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, good segue. Um, good segue. I um, saw an opportunity. Now. I just went yeah, for it. Yeah, and you just went, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, um, extraordinary man and extraordinary constitution. Um, he could you could use that word in a number of ways that were fitting, but he. Um, 
on, on that occasion. We were in Suva, Baini Maram was in power, uh, Winston was foreign minister, it would have been in the 05 to 08 Clark government, he was the foreign minister. It's his first crack at being a foreign minister and he did, did well at it and he looks good in a suit and he, he, uh, he, he, he loved the job. And we'd had um, a huge day and a huge night and then Winston sort of entered the fray about midnight um, and got someone to get him a bottle of scotch and a couple of packets of durries and um, I, I remember um, looking around and seeing that just about all my colleagues were gone and I think one or two of us were there with Winston and I, I remember scraping what was left of my soul up off the ground and getting into some ho- hotel and feeling like I'd eaten sandpaper the next day you know that sort of feeling and we struggled along um, to, to film this event that he was doing and walked in there. And he had been up all that time and he wiped the floor with everyone. Alexander Down, all these foreign ministers were around and he was articulate, he was professional, he was, uh, you know, exuberant, all of those things. And I just looked at him and thought, you know, who sent you? Yeah. <laughs> who are you? Yeah. You know, um, but, and he might not like this, but... I remember um, I told his press secretary, James Fennell, at the time, I said, oh, yeah, I had this massive night out with Winston, and it was quite complimentary about him. It must have got back to Winston, and just before he was about to jump on the plane, my phone rang, and it was Peter's, and he was utterly livid with me. And he's very, very private, you know. He, he did not want anyone to know about that, so he probably won't like this. But he, um, incredibly strange private man, he's like that with smoking as well, you know. He, um, he keeps his drinking and his, and his smoking very much to, to himself, which I guess is his prerogative and maybe reflects his, um, his, his age and generation too to some degree. But he was, um, he was really, really upset that I'd even talked to his press secretary about it, which was quite an interesting coda to the night. Yeah. When you're drinking with Winston Peters, obviously it's all off the record. Are you talking policy? Are you talking anything that yeah, relates to, to what you do? Or is it all just, just other stuff which doesn't affect politics? No, you'd usually be, I mean, that, that, that was the good thing about that kind of environment, and I'm, there were numerous nights not nearly as big as that, the Green Parrot. I don't know if you know the Green Parrot, that's his favourite restaurant in Wellington. It, it, so it's a steakhouse, really, and, and they come out with about 15 pieces of white bread with butter on it, and that, and that's your starter, that's the entree. <laughs> yeah. And then the Beautiful. main, the main Beautiful. <laughs> course is just a plate of steak. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And, and he used to smoke durries inside when you weren't allowed to smoke durries inside anymore. But, you know, just hoi off to waka, you know, he used to just go for it. And um, and you'd be yarning, you'd be saying, oh, this policy's crap, or what about, you know, Birch has done this, or why are you guys doing that? And it was all pretty free, you know. Mm. It was all pretty free and pretty good. And when you're at politics, nah, you just love that, you know. I mean, that's like being able to talk to, you know, I don't know, one of the big rugby players or whatever and just talk talk shop with all them. And, you know, and, and he'll remember something, be telling you stuff. And you, you learn a lot too in those kinds of environments, um, t- talking off the record to politicians. But to Stevie's question, do you delve into, like, how's your kids? And how uh, do, do, you, do you go beyond guy on... Mm the journalist and Winston the politician or is are those roles assigned regardless of your interaction? That again is a bloody good question and I'd never thought about it but you're right it is the latter right? and I'd never thought about that but that's exactly what you do do and you could go I never asked Winston Peters about his personal life ever yeah. Um, about his mum or his girlfriend or whatever it was at the time. And you didn't with those politicians. No, you're right. It was. We were roles in a movie, in our own heads. Yeah. You know, um, and I played the role of a political journalist. A journalist. Um, yeah, no, 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 none of the politicians w- would do that. There were a couple who, you know, I remember when my mum died, for example, there were a couple of politicians who, they were just probably p- more caring people. Yeah. Um, it was a... It, it, you know, we've had a massive injection of expectation of empathy nowadays that, that, that sort of um, drifts into all aspects of our work lives, right? Um, that didn't really exist then, yeah, I true, reckon. Yeah, true, And, um, you know, if you lobbed up, you were Guy and Espen, a journalist um, for the Evening Post or whatever, and that's how you'd be treated. Um, and no one really was too interested in, you know, whether you'd just been divorced or had your third kid. Um, it, that was certainly the way. Or maybe that was me. To, to a degree, maybe that was just what I was angling a- angling at, um, but certainly, yeah, it was all it was all shop talk. That that was a fantastic seg. I do want to link us back to that 2017 interview. Your the, your most memorable one, perhaps your favourite. Afterwards, after the cameras stop, yeah. I can sort of see you smiling. I'm assuming he's smiling off camera. Like, what does it look like in those minutes after that interview? 
Well, Winston Peters has this great Cheshire, Cheshire cat grin uh, that he'll deliver to you just after he's delivered a withering sort of blow. So I think he deployed that. Um, I felt pretty good after that one. Uh, so, you know, and, and in, in some ways it was probably one of the only times where I felt like I'd walked out of the ring um, at, with a points victory over Peters. He's bloody hard to interview. Yeah. I tell you, he's incredibly difficult to interview. And I did feel, and, and yeah, look, if that feels a bit, you know, um, a bit macho and a bit competitive, well, sorry, but it is, you know, it is a bit like that. Um, and and an, it is competitive, you know, and, and you are trying to derail them, actually. Yeah. Not, not to try to crush their skulls into the ground um, for, for sort of brutality, mm. but you're trying to get a politician, you're trying to derail them because, you know, they want to go straight down their... Uh, train track of their of their talking points. You've been listening a bit to Morning Report recently. You might hear Chris Luxon. He's got a sheet there for the radio interview, and if it says Corin Dan on the top, he's been calling me Corin Dan because yeah. <laughs> he, even though he knows me pretty well, because we've had yarns, I've done pieces on him and stuff. And but but my point being that politicians are really really scripted in what they want to say, and you, you've got to be um, you've got to be quite strategic and creative to, to to get them off off that. So you've got to have a plan. You really got to have a plan, otherwise it's just, um, you know, it's just a bunch of questions, and anyone can do that. I think Winston is quite unique because you're trying to derail them. I think it's rare for a politician to try to derail you at the same time. We had Jack Tame on, who talked about a memorable Winston interview, and he kept calling him James Tame, and he actually talked about the advice you gave him. He's like, he's going to try to drop your little breadcrumbs. Just stay on track. Don't go for them. Because uh, he tries to derail you, it's unique. Is that unique to Winston? It, it, it absolutely is, and it's a good lesson if you've interviewed Winston. And I, I tell this to journalists: you've got to have an exit strategy. Like, what's your exit strategy if he turns it around on you? You've got to have one. And I learned that in in agenda uh, early on when I'd just started television interviewing. And I loved television in, in, interviewing, the art of the long form interview. And I'd watched Ian Fraser as a kid, and I loved um, the long the long form interview and. Uh, the craft of it. And I had watched Winston a number of times and I thought, what am I going to do if he turns it around on me? And I had a line that I had actually practised. And so um, I, I said to him, he, he did exactly that on a live television interview and started asking me the questions. And I said to him, look, if you want to la- learn shorthand, go to Polytech, get a journalism degree and ask the questions you can. But right now I'm asking the questions and you're giving the answers. And my question is, X. Boom. And, wow. That's a practice. And, and it was, because yeah. I can still remember it now. Yeah. That Do you was, still use it now? I wouldn't use that one, but <laughs> I'd use something. I'd use some, if you are going to go for someone, um, you've got to have an exit strategy. I remember Winston Peters on a program, and I won't name the interviewer. It was live on television at High Pressure Moment. The allegation was involving whether New Zealand First Party had somehow changed its position in return for some favours. Um, and Scampy was um, part of the of, of the deal. It was about Scampy Catch, and I won't go into it too, in too much detail because it was a source of endless litigation. And Peters turned to the interviewer and said, yeah, I sold my soul for a plate of fish. And at that point, the interview was all over, effectively, because he'd won the public and it looked ludicrous. So what are you going to do when the person turns the tables on you? I think in that same interview or another one, I'd seen him say, well, where did you get that fact from? And the interviewer said, my researcher, and at that point, it was all off. It was yeah. all gone. That's why in a, in a strong interview, if you're taking someone on, it, it's you said in the Herald on July the 17th, 2007, that quote, bang, or you know, OECD figures from X say this. Yeah. You've got to source your stuff. It, not, not, not in a casual interview with a hurricane survivor or whatever, but if you were going to take on a politician like Winston Peters, you've got to have it all nailed down yeah. and you've got to have an exit strategy for what to do because he will turn the tables on you. And um, he's about the only one who, do, who does. He learned at the foot of Muldoon. And I don't think any of them nowadays would really do that. Um, there might be one who comes along and does. David Seymour might. He, he can be fairly, fairly gnarly. But, um, yeah, not many who would do it in the way Winston Peters does. I love that you still remember the exit strategy word for word all these years later. <laughs> like, that was so good. Yeah. yeah. And also, like, again, hearing you speak about it and then having watched it freshly, you're quoted, your, these are your words. These are your words that I'm reading. That's what you were saying back to Winston in that interview. Is that it, so you can't twist and turn and get out of it. From his perspective. Yeah, I mean, you'll hear interviewers saying, um, why has the National Party used a dog whistle strategy on three waters? 
That's a hopeless question because where is it written down? Then you're just going to get into an argument about whether so-and-so was being racist or dog whistling. You've, you, you've actually got to... I mean, the, the analogy I use is you're running rats down a corridor. And if you don't close off all the side doors, they can take anyone they want, and they will. And, and, and they'll run down the clock, they'll run out the, uh, the side. You've got to close all the doors and run them right out the back. And it, to do that, you, you, need to, you need to be specific. You you really love journalism, don't you? Yeah, I do, and I love the, I love the art of the interview. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, it that, is it that obvious? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's really fascinating. fascinating. Obviously, we're in the game of interviewing, so it's, yeah, it's so great. It. It's yeah. so great uh, hearing this from you. Does Winston? Have, I'm sorry, we're not going to spend the whole time talking mm. about Winston, but I do have one more question. Did you have? Did you fall out with him? Like, does he have a line where if you push him too hard, he's he's not going to respond to you anymore? Like, was was that? Yeah, interview? I think I, I yeah, and it wasn't that interview really. I think it probably he would be far less well disposed to me now. He could have he could have li- that the relationship could have survived that interview. Is when I started looking into the New Zealand First Foundation and uh, getting the documents on on the New Zealand First Foundation, which ended up with a a court case. I'm choosing my words carefully here because, again, um, you know, there are some litigious people involved. Um, And this was about the donations that that party received. And we probably did 20 stories um, on that, all all of them valid, and there wasn't one fact that was contested. Um, But he did not like that. Um, And, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship between the media and Winston Peters. Uh, He pretends he hates them but can't do without them and they pretend he's evil but have built their careers on him. Mm. And it's a, there's a sort of mutual thing happening there, and it's all done with a wink and a smile and a nod, um, but um, the gloves, went, gloves were off there because we had a duty to, um, to pursue the story in the public interest, but he didn't like it. I imagine if I ran into him today, we'd probably, we'd probably laugh about it now, but yeah. um, I, don't, I don't know. Zooming out, the wider uh, morning report, five years there, I think you said you've done over a 1,000 shows. Over time, does the research and prep you do for each day get less and less? Like, yeah, it, uh, it's interesting because I ran into Tover O'Brien the other day, and, and we, we were having a chat um, about getting up uh, at crap o'clock in the morning. And I said to her that one of the lessons I learned was that Trump, sorry, one of the lessons I learned was that sleep trumps prep. In that, if you get up, you better to get up at four, th- four o'clock in the morning than three in the morning because that extra hour is better spent sleeping than, than prepping. Um, you, you, with Morning Report, you know, some days you'd be doing 10 interviews in a morning, um, but all interviews aren't created equal. So I would, like I did Hipkins this morning, and I did, I would have, if there was a pie chart on it, um, I would have spent 70 or 80% of my prep time on that one interview because it was the PM, and I wanted a, I wanted to nobble them on a consultant spending. So I wanted to know what um, what had been spent on consultants in... Um, you know, for example, MB, mm. and it's a hundred million. But I wanted to know how many staff they had, and they had just over five thousand staff. Five thousand staff, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, but that's a great number to yeah. have. But yeah. then, then, then you can say to them, "Oh, it's be you know, hundred million dollars on um, consultancy for for MB. How many staff do they have?" <laughs> because it, it, because you're doing a couple of things there. Then because there's the silent, and then it, because it makes, and then you're like five thousand. It has more of an impact. Yeah. So so you got to do your. Um, so I thought. I'd, I'd dig into that and, and, and have a close look at look look at that. So, yeah, you'd, 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 you'd prep, but not equally. You know, it's like swatting for an exam. You, you get in there and you, you, you've got to pick your moments. You, I reckon you'd be foolish to divide the time in 10 because sometimes you're talking to a correspondent who's got all the info anyway. Sometimes you're talking to someone who found a penguin or something. And, um, you know, sometimes you're talking to the PM. So you've got you to pick your moments, pick your, pick your battles. I would assume in Morning Report that you would have like a, a structure and an agenda set out for how the morning's going to go and things would change very quickly. Were there times where you were very underprepared for an interview that you had to do straight away and you, and you didn't know about the subject at all and you just kind of have to bluff your way through? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, a minister has said that they won't come on and then um, suddenly they ring in and the producer's saying, um, you know, Judith Collins or... Stephen Joyce um, were two of the people who did that a few times, I remember. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you'd suddenly be, be, be thrown into it. Um, so, yeah, some, sometimes it is uh, seat-of-the-pants stuff. 
Um, for those who don't know, I mean, you, you stepped away from Morning Report a few years ago and you got into investigative journalism, but you are back. You, you said you're doing it this morning. You're stepping in just a, a week on, week off basis just to cover. And yeah, that's right. And I've, I've been really enjoying it um, because I've come back to it. And I think I've come back to it with, a, with more lightness because it's not my program. When you have a program, eh, you you really worry about the ratings and you worry about yes, how we it's do. going. Yes, we do. You That's know, exactly what we do. You, you, you know, and it's, it's, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure there. Yeah. You know, um, I took over from a guy who spent 39 years there. 39 years, you know. It's like Jeff Boycott. No one could get him out. He's so <laughs> he, he, flowing, he, aren't he, they? He, he, These cricketing analogies. Yeah, it is a, it is a bit obsessive. <laughs> it's really um, good. But... Um, so there's a lot of pressure, it's like morning report, and people in Wellington. Auckland's a bit different. I wish I wish it was a bigger deal in in, in Auckland, but in Wellington, everyone listens to morning report. Yeah. It's kind of weird, you know. <clears throat> yeah. I was walking down Lampton Quay the first morning after I'd done morning report, and people would 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 stop you and say, oh, "I was listening to you in the shower today." And it is like really weird. It's like, <laughs> oh man, you're listening to me when you're getting dressed, and like it's just like I don't know. You kind of feel seen in Welling in Wellington, especially because it's just it's just utterly in the fabric of that place because it's public service, a politics town, right? And it's a, it's a fairly, you know, it still is a, a fairly fa- uh, fairly serious show. But um, so I, I've come back and um, and I'm more relaxed doing it and I think um, just showing a bit, a bit of a different side, you know, and having a bit more fun with it. Um, if it's not still not illegal to have fun on RNZ, then so maybe we're doing it. To, to follow your career, um, you have left a lot of these jobs when you've been doing really well at them. Uh, it seems like you sort of like a, a bit of change and a, and a new challenge. And you left Morning Report when you were a very exceptionally popular host, and I think people were a bit surprised by that. Um, but I was hoping you could t- talk to us about journalism, because you've gone back to being a reporter, investigative journalism. We haven't even spoken about your 10 years in print. But was it just, what was it, a point in your life where you decided that you wanted to go back to what you originally started with? Or why did you leave, and, and what are you doing now? Yeah, it was uh, September the 11th, 2018, and I was in hospital with um, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. I'm a type 1 diabetic, um, which I didn't know until that point. I got admitted to hospital, and um, I was lying there thinking, what do I want to do? This feels like a moment. And one of the things I felt I hadn't done in journalism was actually break big investigative stories. Um, There was journalists that I'd I'd, um, admired and, and hadn't, felt that I'd competed with them, the Oscar Alleys and the Duncan Garners and the Matt Nippets and David Fishers, I suppose, of the world, and, and there are others, um, and thought, I want to go back to being a reporter, you know, with a lowercase r, you know, because, I- interestingly, in New Zealand journalism, you get promoted to being a presenter, you don't do any journalism, and they are the top jobs, and people just cling on to them forever, and then you've got the columnists all doing their thing that everyone reads and knows and they can see their pictures and stuff. And the grunt work tends to be done in this ecosystem by the younger ones who haven't got as much experience. And that's not to, to denigrate them at all. There's incredible younger journalists there. But it, it seems like the ecosystem is, everything else feeds off that, right? Because you can't get the commentary or the presentation without the actual journalism that's done on the ground. And I thought, what would it be like if a greybeard, you know, someone with a few a few years on the clock, goes back as a reporter and calls himself a reporter. You know, everyone calls himself a senior journalist nowadays. Yeah, does it, yeah. So I, I just thought, well, why don't I do go back to being a reporter um, and call myself a reporter and think of myself as a reporter and just dig in and, and do these um, investigative pieces? And, and that's what I did, and, and I, I feel that that's some of the work that I've been the, uh, uh, the most proud of doing, you know, our investigations into Pharmac and the SIS and the New Zealand First Foundation um, and the police shootings and those sorts of stories. I, I'm incredibly proud of those, and they are grunt work journalism, and that's what I wanted to do and wanted to get back to doing. You've done some fantastic work. You're, you're top of the field. I, I wanted to know how you decide what to attack, and I understand you've you've often got four or five things on the go at once, but when that is happening, are you thinking, I'm just going to pick an area where I, I think... I could affect change, or there might be something there, and go digging in and see what you find. Like, how do you decide what to attack? Yeah, it was sometimes, and I like this saying that, um, and the Washington Press Corps has this saying that, don't worry about the illegal stuff. Concern yourself with what's legal, because that's what society has accepted. And I quite like that. So you get these hiding in plain sight stories. And in fact, the drinking game, the book, is a bit like that. You know, th- this is a whole thing about. 
a legal drug, right? And and legal marketing practices and you know there's nothing illegal going on there, but it's what we are prepared to accept. And sometimes that's the really interesting stuff to to, to look at. I did that with Lotto too. Thought, gee, isn't it interesting? We spend one and a half billion dollars on these lottery tickets, and then we give. 20 cents and every dollar back to the community and we, and we think that that's somehow doing them a favour, <laughs> you know. And so you, you've got, and it's often the poorer communities who are buying these ta- all these tickets and spending all Is this money. Is it 20 money. cents and every dollar? Yeah. I thought it was 100%. I know, but it's not. It's 20 cents. So it, it, so it's 20 cents and every dollar, right, um, that, 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 that's, that's given back after you take all the marketing, all those incredible ads um, shot in Antarctica and everywhere, and after you take the hundreds of thousands of dollars they pay the, the CEOs and the, all the staff yeah, that they right. use, it's, it's just over 20 cents. It's 20 cents from the physical stores, and it's about 25 cents if it's on the internet app because it's low cost of, 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 um, of delivery of, of service. But um, yeah, it's a hell of a money go round. It's about three hundred and fifty million they give back to the community out of a one point five billion dollar um, spend. And of course, there's the prize money too, right? So, so they've got to pay, got to pay that out too. too. So, but, but that's an example of just going. Usually, I look for. <coughs> usually, I look for money, power, um, moral ambiguity. So I did that with Farmac as well. Just went. Okay, here's this here's this um, massive um, state agency that effectively can decide who lives or dies. There's they've they've got a restricted budget. There's there's moral sort of ambiguity here. How does this whole thing work? And then just dig into that, and then and then find the stories within that. Because people people think, oh, you know, investigative journalist, if you're waiting for someone to give you a great tip, sometimes that happens. A mate of mine um, gave me this great tip on the SIS, which we, we did into a podcast and we followed up with a number of stories. There's, in a country like New Zealand, there's not, you know, if you're waiting for Deep Throat to give you a call from the car park about, the, about some big tip, you might be waiting a long yeah. time. And so sometimes you just have to go, well, how does that work? Mm. Why do we do that? And um, sometimes I just start with thinking about a, an agency or a, a sector. I'm doing something on lobbying at the moment. How does political lobbying work? What do they do? Who are the big players? And and then just digging in and seeing what you can find. So sometimes that's the approach I, I take. Once you start pulling at that thread, does it become all-consuming? Like yeah, this is. I mean, the, with, with morning report, you're done at nine o five, and especially if you've been doing it for a while, then 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 that's it. You, you gave it. You're all on the park, and and then you're gone for the day, and you're back and doing it another day. Um, but with the investigative stuff, especially if they're more sensitive stories, you know, you're taking a call at 7.30, your source is texting you at night, um, you know, th- there's worry and there's threats of defamation. I remember when doing the New Zealand First um, Foundation stories, there was a letter tabled in Parliament with a, a sort of a threat to sue me for $30 million. I remember going walking every evening as the anxiety just rose, just thinking, how are we going to sort of get through this? So it does hang over you a lot more when you're doing those sorts of yarns because you're, you're spending, you know, at least a couple of months on them. Mm. Um, and then when it's about to come out, you're like, you know, that's often quite high stakes. You, you talk to threats. You won't go to China anymore based on some of the work that you've done. No, I wouldn't go back to China. I've been to China a few times, but I wouldn't go back there after Red Line. No, yeah. no. And is that just because of some of the things that you uncovered through the the putting together of that story yeah I just um, and I talked to others who, um, who who said yeah that's that's a good strategy and um, some people who would be in the know that look you know I don't want to overblow what what would happen but I, I wouldn't I, I, I don't think I'd be terribly welcome there uh, take very kindly to, to, to criticism so I, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be rushing to, to get my tourist visa no I think this has set the platform nicely to talk about the drinking game because we've touched on you know, what an important part alcohol was through work, late night drinking with Winston Peters. You know, this was a big part of your life. And then decision to step away from it. Um, can you tell us about where it started from and, and, yeah, give us the whole story? Yeah, yeah. So um, if I start at the end of the, of, of, of the drinking, um, it was just one Sunday morning in mid-2019. And, and I, didn't, I didn't take the date and write it down in the diary because I didn't want to know. Um, I didn't want to be one of those guys who counts off the counts off the days, um, but I had just had a dinner party at home, um, and I couldn't remember what had happened after about nine thirty. Uh, my wife at the time said that I hadn't done anything too silly or you know anything crazy, um, and I just decided that morning that that was it. 
you know, I'd, I'd wasted all my chances. You know, I was a cat with 90 lives, if you like. I had tried every mitigation strategy going, you know. I'd be, oh, I'll drink low-strength beer until 9 o'clock and then cut into the real stuff. Oh, it's red wine that got me that time. I'm not going to drink red wine anymore. Oh, I'll download the app that tells me how many units I've had. Oh, I'll only drink Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever it was. Um, every time it failed. And there would have been a hundred of those strategies because I didn't want to give up because I was so scared of giving up because of the social ramifications. I thought that giving up alcohol would mean giving up friendships and relationships and social life. You know, I really did. I was scared of that. And I so throughout the, the drinking time, some of which was quite damaging, let's be honest, a lot of it was fun too. I'm going to be silly. If it was easy, if it was just good and bad and, you know, um, good and evil, then this would be an easy an easy thing. It's not like that. I mean, I had some amazing times with alcohol and many people still do. And I love being around people who are drinking. So it's not, it's not like this. It's this terrible thing. Um, but, um, yeah, I was really frightened of having to give up uh, totally. And that's why I tried all these strategies when really I should have realised by well, wow, really by my early 20s that alcohol didn't suit me because I never had the off switch. I didn't have that. I, th- I mean, some of the science now is saying that there is actually a signal from your liver to your, to your central nervous system somehow that tells you, hey, you've had enough. And we all know people who don't have that signal, whatever it is, when they shouldn't have any more. Um, I was someone who would just override that signal, just, did, did, just didn't, didn't, didn't happen. And so, um, yeah, just getting back to that, that morning, I made that decision that morning and haven't drunk a drop since and haven't, haven't felt the urge to. I didn't feel I needed to go to any uh, counselling or services. I'm not disrespecting people who do. I didn't feel I had a chemical dependency. I clearly didn't because I, I didn't crave it. Um, so that p- possibly was easier for me. Um, but, yeah, that, that's been it. That's the last time I've, I've, uh, I've drank and it will be the last time that I do drink. If anyone ever asks me why I stopped that is it that's my story is that right yeah that is the the off switch um the I'll just do this I'll do this I'll do this the mitigations that like that is a hundred like, I'm, right? I'm captivated by that and just thinking fuck yeah those are all I've never been articulate enough to kind of piece it together but what you've said there is essentially like kind of my story the same thing like I I had a moment where the decision was made. I had a wedding that weekend that I went to, and I thought, well, fuck, if I can get through the wedding, I'll be all right. And I got through the wedding, and it's it's just been the same thing ever since. And it um, and I was interested in it because I've, I've got a I've got a bugbear about this. The term sober. Are, are you sober? Do you call yourself no. sober? Yeah, no, I'm the same. No, I don't. Yeah. I, don't I, I don't. I don't call my I don't call myself sober. And I'm not a sober advocate. You know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not like oh you know s- s- sobriety and stuff. I, I'm not it's just this, this isn't my this isn't my drug doesn't suit me. Um, and you know it it, it 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 never did. It was insidious too because this wouldn't happen all the time. I don't know about you, yeah. but it was about a six week thing. Yep. You know so so every six weeks or so, and sometimes be once every month, but but about six weeks just roughly. I'm just guessing. There'd be there'd be nights where I just couldn't remember what had happened, and the weight of shame. It's just, it's hard to explain. I said, oh, well, probably not for a lot of people listening because they will have felt it themselves, but not drinking and that lightness of being, that never having shame is really good, is really good. You yeah. can't explain how good that is because you never have that feeling about, did I do no. such and such? Did I say that? Who, what, what was then? You don't oh, have to check your phone in the morning and go, fuck, did piece I? Piece the night together through taxi receipts, text messages, <laughs> um, you know, it's funny for a while, um, but yeah, shame bears a heavy burden, eh, I reckon, and um, it's just a really unpleasant thing. They call it anxiety now, because it's unfortunately it's a chemical thing as well as an emotional thing, because the alcohol actually does increase the anxiety, and so you get this really sort of, uh, you know, in, intense feeling, and it just simply wasn't wasn't worth it anymore. I was an, I was an idiot to, to, to drink for as long as I did, um, you know, because it was clearly uh, clearly not a good strategy for me. And um, part of the reason for writing the book was to, to tell people, hey, you might be one of the probably 20-odd percent, maybe a bit more of people who doesn't suit you, mate. It doesn't suit you, so it's okay not to, not to drink it. And we can all go out and have fun, but I, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't suit me, so I, I, I'm not going to do it. And I, I hope that that's becoming an easier path to take for people. Is this a passion project for you, the, the writing of the book? Is it part of that reconciliation with yourself? 
Yeah, it probably is. Again, I hadn't thought about it in that way. But um, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um, I had been wanting to do a book for a while, and then when the, the proof documentary came out, Alan and Unwin, Michelle Hurley from Alan and Unwin rang the next day and said, would you do a book on it? I wondered, I wondered that, whether yeah. it was an extension of it the was. work you'd done yeah. in, the, in that. It was an extension of the doco, book. yeah. And, um, and I'd been toying around with a book, and interestingly, she was... We talked about a book on Winston Peters, and I, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And then we were talking about a book on the John Key years, which I was quite interested in, and didn't do that. Um, and then uh, this one, I thought, yeah, because I can also, because it's a love letter to journalism too, and we, you know, we're all fascinated in interviewing and, and journalism, and and I wanted to get some of that stuff down, like what it was, what the newsrooms were like back in those days, yeah. you know, um, what it, you know, in the Wamaru Mail. Um, you know, the, the Christchurch newspapers or whatever, like back in the day. Because as time goes on, it is a little bit of history. And so I wanted to get some of that down too. So, uh, you know, if it was a cocktail, it'd be part memoir, part history and part journalism, really, with um, with a twist of advocacy, <laughs> possibly. We had um, Paddy Gower on our pod, uh, maybe one of his last beers with us. We did it remotely. But um, were you, you were instrumental. What role did you play when you can see someone else who's who's deciding whether or not they're going to go the same path, do you give advice? Do you give them a nudge? Like, what what do you say? I haven't been in that situation, and I I wasn't part really of 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 Gower's decision. Corin Dan, who's a mutual close friend of both of ours, was, and that came came across in, in the documentary. And uh, Corin's wife Lotta Lotta Dan, who has been a real trailblazer in this speech and was recognised as such in the, in the Queen's Birthday Honours, and deservedly so. She's written a couple of books, you know, um, The Wine O'Clock Myth and others, um, and Mrs D Is Going Without, which was her first book. And she, she's a close friend, and, um, you know, she was one of the first person people I rang when I started to make that proof documentary, and so she's been a big part in, in all this. But, yeah, I haven't been in a position um, where I have been giving advice uh, to, to, to people on that. Um, a few people have talked to me a, a, about it, and I, I just sort of try to, to draw them out and, and, and see where they're at with it. And, and you know, I, I certainly don't run around telling people what, what to do um, or, or make comments on it. But um, I do talk to my friends who who can ask me about what they think about and ha- and have good open conversations about about alcohol and and I, I think I think that's good because it's been a taboo subject really you know to mention someone's drinking I don't know about about you did did, did anyone say to you hey mate you probably because I my experience was that people just didn't want to it was like sex or politics you know <laughs> it's just something that wasn't talked about like yeah. can you even with a close partner they they people don't in New Zealand tell you know have those conversations maybe they do now do they? I don't know. We had that ugly conversation. You guys did. Stephen and I. That's yeah. awesome. Mm. Yeah, it is. Did Stephen raise it with you? Called me out on it. Shit, good on you, man. Yeah. Because that's hard to do. It's harder for the person to do it. That's really cool. Yeah, I think yeah. I think so. I think um, I knew, maybe like you did, I knew deep down oh, it, was, it, was, it was problematic yeah. and I knew it was destructive and I knew it wasn't service serving me anymore. But to have someone do you respect that you love take the time to have that conversation as as and knowing how and I can't look at him at the moment and knowing how uncomfortable that must have been um, but to go fuck it I'm going to push through and I'm going to tell him and I'm going to tell him straight and I'm going to tell him if you do you can get fucked because I don't want to be around that guy anymore wow um, paraphrasing a little yeah. bit for for this for, this, for the sake, for the sake <laughs> yeah. of, of, of a good of a good sound bite yeah but I think then taking that and going Man, he's he's right. I know he's right, and I just needed to kind of hear that message at that time for what you know, whatever reason. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe there've been signs from other people before, and I just didn't want to didn't want to listen or didn't want to ignore it. But at that moment, in that uh, yeah, in that climate, I just like yeah, that's it. He's right. I'm done. And same as you, not a drop since, and no desire to. Yeah, it's amazing when it's off the table. It's just off the table. It, how your mind can just make that uh, switch. Man, congratulations! That, that's a, such a cool thing to have done to some, for someone because he's, you, you know, he's changed your life there, and that, that's that's a brave thing to do. I I, I don't hear that enough, um, and so I think it's really cool. Cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, life's life's been a lot better since. Huh? Yeah, totally. And I think to to your point, the fact that once the decision was made, there was very little resistance from the other people that are in my circle. It was almost like. 
the silence was deafening around, around yeah, yeah, yeah. the um the affirmation of the decision it was like yeah it's 100 percent the right thing for you to do yeah um so yeah maybe there, there just needs to be more brave conversations between mates and to push people into those yeah, positions. Absolutely, and to make it more acceptable to have those conversations, you know, to, to, to bring it out of the, the taboo because, um, you know, th- there seems to be this position that it's a, you know, it's a binary thing. You're either an alcoholic, which means you are some sort of piss wreck lying on the ground drinking gin, or, you, or you're a normal drinker. And the normal drinker can go right to crazy levels of drinking, but as long as you can get up and do your job in the morning, then you kind of are just a normal drinker. I was, I was talking to someone in a brewery on the weekend and they said the biggest movers uh, are the low carb and the 0% beers because of, of common situations like this, but it allows you to be a bit more social. It allows you to feel like you're having a beer. Like That's interesting, isn't it? That the, the culture is moving away from it, but we still want that feeling of socially interacting with a beer. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I talk about it in, 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 the, in the book a bit. And pe- some people might see me, me as a bit of a grump, but I don't. I don't use the uh, the no alcohol beers a- at all. Um, I-, I never wanted to. I, I don't want to go there. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to pretend that I'm drinking a beer. Um, have you done the same, Shamus? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. Got, I've, I've, I've. People have said that. Yep, just go for a zero, and I'm like, nah, because I know myself, and I know if I go down that route. I'll allow myself a little bit of wiggle room, and then before I know it, it'll be oh, I'll just have a beer. Same as me. Like, what's the, the next step will be a, a Fugazi or something, or some, you know, two and a half percent, and, yep. then, and <laughs> then I'm working my way back <laughs> yeah. up, back up the shelf, you know. Yeah, um, totally, and, and, I'd be totally and, the same. Yeah, so so I, I don't I don't drink them at all. Um, but but having said that, I think it's great for drinkers. You know, you, you can have two or three beers and and then you have a couple of no lows. I think they call them, don't they? No yeah. or low alcohol. Yeah. And that's cool, man. Yeah. I, I think that if it works for you, absolutely. But um, yeah, for me, I'm just like, nah, I'm I'm out. I don't want I don't want to pretend one. I I'm, I'd just rather ignore it altogether. Yeah, flying off the shelves. I've got a, a number of friends that are really into them. So yeah, you can have them and drive. Um, look, I know we're pressed for time. We've got a couple of minutes left. There's there's a bunch of stuff we want to get to, but maybe we can just do a little bit on each. First, I'm not really sure this is my place to commend you on it, but your Tereo journey, uh, the way that you've brought it to the mainstream, your your fluency in it has been really inspirational. Um, I've struggled with that it, on this podcast. You know, there's been a number of times where I've tripped over words but seeing how well you've done it has been really inspirational. So thank you for that oh, and, cool. and bringing it out. Like, can you just talk a little bit about how important that's been? Yeah, you? yeah, it's been massively important. Um, I, I married a Māori woman, and when we had our daughter, Nico, we wanted to give her her language. And so in about 2017, when we'd made a decision that, um, you know, she was uh, about three or four at the time, that we were going to send her to a Rumaki school, you know, to a, a Māori immersion school. I saw, um, well, she wasn't at Kohanga Reo, so... Um, what I wanted to give her the language at home, and so I thought I better, um, I better learn. And so, and also didn't want to be left out when she was um, speaking with her friends later in life. And so I just started hitting the books um, and just started learning. And people like Stacey and Scotty Morrison were massive, um, you know, support for me in that. And um, yeah, I just fell in love with the language and just wanted to to do as much as I, as I could. And at the time, I had I had the red light, had the had the mic, and so I just started thinking, oh well, um, th- as I learn it, I'll, I'll try and sh- share some more with um, with the listeners. And so I just started doing it off my own bat. There was no I mean, some people were like, oh, I did Radio New Zealand social engineering or something. It wasn't that. It was no strategy at all. It was just like um, started with some greetings and then extended it to, to the point where we did. Some bilingual interviews you would do, you know, um, ask the question in Māori, but always translate it. So I always translated every phrase I've ever used on RNZ, yeah. never left anyone behind. So people will say, oh, but you don't translate it. Well, the, the bit I say in English afterwards is, is what I've just said. Yeah. So always do that. Never want to be elitist about it or leave people behind. It was like, hey, this is, and try to have fun with it. Um, and I learned that kind of off the Morrisons, who are just amazing advocates for it, without making people feel bad. It's just like, have have a go. It's not a precious vase that if you drop it, it's going to break. It's not this thing. It, it's it's a language, you know. And let's let's bring it to life and and have it as a you know something that has utility and agency, and you, you can use it. It's not this thing to put in a glass case, and only people with special powers can use it. Yeah. It's it's our language from this land, and so we can you know we we can use it. And I think we're all getting to that that space a bit more now. But that was the kind of the 
that was kind of the cope upper of it at, at, at that time in 2017. Yeah. You can't can you, you can't do the real without Te Ao Māori as well. So have, the, have those two sort of come hand in hand? Yeah, massively. I mean, so some people are like, oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn it like French, and you hear a lot of politicians say it's not even there from the right place, and I'm gonna get a tutor and stuff. But you you, Google, you can't. It's, it's you, you got to go to the Wanangan, you got to go to the Nohomarain, you got to you know. So you, you can't. You, you, I don't think you can um, separate the two things out. I mean, f- for me with my daughter and, and, and her school and it's it's a Māori community and, you know, so I, I haven't had to try that hard to, to, to get into that. Um, so that's kind of just been the way that it's sort of rolled. So I've been I've been incredibly lucky in that. And um, the support from Māori, um, which I can say to other Pākehā who are, ha- who are nervous about that, has just been incredible. Mm. I've had no, no one. The, the people who have criticised me have all been Pākehā. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for speaking, yeah. Um, Running, just quickly, uh, you run two marathons a year, every year for 10 years. You've done a run with Kathy Freeman. I th- uh, Kathy Freeman. Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Kathy Freeman. Mm. Uh, and I think there's a story that you ran about 42 Ks one Christmas day. Like running is a very important central part of your life. Um, why is it so important? Yeah, I probably run, I probably run for my, my head as much as for my heart. Um, yeah, w- when... My mother died, and I'd also broken up from a long-term relationship. Um, this is about oh three, oh four, around that sort of time. Um, I found myself with a lot of time on my hands. My mate Corin Dad said, Corin Dan said, why don't you run around the bays in Wellington? It's like a 5K run or something. And I did that, and I quite enjoyed it. And then I just started running and running more and found it to be a really amazing thinking time as, as you got used to, to, to doing that, and I still run five times a week. It's half marathons nowadays. I've got one coming up in a couple of weeks. Five times a week? How, how far oh, do you just run? Just 10k a time. Just, yeah. ten, just yeah. 10k? Yeah, just yeah. Not, so, so I'm not doing the big big, big distances, yeah. but I do run five times a week. 10k is a pretty big distance to <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, once, once, you, once you build up, it's amazing what, what you'll get used to. But yeah, it's, a, it's problem solving time for me, you know, and it's still a massive part of my mental health. When I can't do it, I get pretty ratty. Um, so, um, yeah, it's still a massive part of my life. Just the last one for me. Um, you look great. You're, you're running five times a week. You're in a job, back to your roots that you love. You're off the booze. Is, li- is, is this peak guy? Well, um, you know, um, I, I try to make each year better than the last. Like, what haven't I done that I want to do, you know, now? What's the next challenge? What am I going to do? So, um, yeah, I... Um, I don't like to sit still. I do like to, to, to keep moving. And so, yeah, I hope I haven't quite peaked yet. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, Shay, Shay's our outro guy, and I know he's got a good one lined up. Oh, um, don't do, don't yeah. do that. I have to do these on the fly every <laughs> time. Yeah, let, let me just say thank you so much for coming oh, in and sharing your time with us. This it's has been, been great fun. I've really enjoyed it. And it's, it's, it's been a really, really good interview. And, um, yeah, it's just really cool to, to, to have, have a yarn with people who have really, you know, dug in deep and... And looked at it, so thank oh, you. It means a lot coming yeah. from you. Uh, Shay? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow from two of your colleagues first, and then I'm going to try and try and round it out. So Paddy Gower said, and this is kind of where I was going earlier, and I'll read this. He's a journo to his bones, mate. He did some stories recently about prisoner rights. He said to me, nobody cares about prisoners. Fuck it. I do. He's a great man, ethical as fuck, and I still look up to him. And Jack Tame said, I've never and I say this as someone who spent 17 years in the business, met anyone who cares as much about journalism as Guyon. And today has been, and the research particularly, has been a lesson in storytelling and the joy in storytelling. And what I get fascinated by is the fact that you can tell a story in a, a news track for TVNZ or, or TV3. You can do it through an interview. And you can do it through a, a long-form story. You can do it through Docker. You can do it through all of the mediums that we have access to now. And that flexibility and the art of the narrative and asking good questions and storytelling, which is what we try and do here on the podcast, has been incredibly inspirational to kind of see how you've done that. But from a personal perspective, you shining the light on an area that particularly resonates with me. And not only the alcohol um, documentary that you did, but also your take on drugs. I had a very narrow perspective of, of drugs and what I thought was drugs. And, and watching Wasted really made me change my perception on that. And I think that's something 
I don't know, put words or, th or thoughts or feelings into your mind, but that whole element of sharing and shining the light so people can make their own decisions, inform decisions based on that is a really, really important skill, particularly in, in the age of misinformation now. Um, so I just, I love what you do. And I've learned so much just in the, in the week of preparation for this and to have the opportunity to sit and, and hear you speak and be in your presence has been amazing. So thank you very much for, for coming in. Oh, that's awesome. That's, uh, that, that, that means a lot. It's, that's absolutely lovely. So, and, and thank you. Thank you both. Cheers, guys.